John chapter 3. Guess what? We're finishing up John 3 uh, this morning, Lord willing. And yeah, we're, we're, we're getting through it. So we're, we're moving through. And it's a, it's a glorious gospel. It's a glorious gospel. It's tough. It's tough stuff because we're hit just with God's absolute sovereignty. And that kind of rubs against us at times. But this is who he is. And praise the Lord for that. Without that, we're in trouble. We're left in our sins. So he is good to us. So we're going to continue on John chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 22 through 36. This is John the Baptist's testimony towards the Lord. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and they remained there with them, with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Selim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not, not yet been put into prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. And John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from, from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in earthly ways. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony, set, he sets his seal, seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, as we come before your precious word, we simply ask your blessing that you would pour out your spirit, Lord, upon us, illuminate our hearts, give us understanding of this precious word. I pray that our minds would be very much um, focused upon you, Lord, and upon your precious word. Take the cares of the day away, the cares of the week, Lord, and let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, I pray that you would be with me to bring forth your message that honors and glorifies you and that challenges us, strengthens us, encourages us in our faith. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, man. Just from reading this, you know that the Christian life, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, I mean a true Christian, walking with the Lord, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> You know how much of a paradox it seems to be as a Christian living in this world, man. It, it, because being a Christian goes so much against the conventional wisdom of the world. It just does, man. And it goes against our natural inclinations. It absolutely does that. Because we live in a world where success is gauged by what? It's gauged by increasing, right? It's gauged by achievement, obtaining, gaining, position, Possessions, popularity, right? wealth, prestige, education, reputation. You're increasing. That's how to get ahead in the world. That's when people look at you and say, wow, look at you. It's different for us as Christians. It's not like my way, that song. If you're under 40, just YouTube my way. If you're over 40, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's the opposite of that. That song like just deifies man. I did it my way. I took the blows and... I faced it all, and I stood tall. I like the Elvis version. Don't get me wrong. I like the song. But the message is really all about man, what we do, how we gain success. The Christian life is just the opposite of that. It's different for us. Our success is measured by our dependence upon Christ, right? It's, it's our greatest achievement is faithfulness to him. Our highest ambition is to serve Christ and others in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
For us, it's all about decreasing. And that's what John's getting at today. That's what I really want to focus on today. He's talking about several things, but that's kind of the main focus of the message. Right? About decreasing. And, and if we're honest, if you're just honest with yourself, it's tough because we're caught in between. We find ourselves caught in between the two of these, increasing and decreasing, like worldly success and truly walking with the Lord, I think more than we'd like to admit. Right? I know I'm like that at times. And you could see a similar struggle with John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, right? They're struggling a little bit because here's John. He's known for what? He's known as the baptizer. That's one of the things he's known for. He's the baptizer. Everybody's going to him, and he's preaching repentance and the need to be baptized. Now we're told that Jesus, actually his disciples, according to 4.2, were baptizing. So, so John's identity, at least to his followers, was caught up in him being, being who he was, man. He's the baptizer. He's the one where people are going to for this. And now Jesus is baptizing over there, and more people are going to him? What's up with that? You know, that's, that's not, that's, should it be that way? And so we see that. And what we have here is a, a transition, even as Jesus is baptizing, between John's baptism and Christian baptism. Both are in water, both point to, to the need for spiritual cleansing. And later, Jesus institutes baptism as an ordinance that replaces circumcision, an outward sign that points to the inward change. So you have that going on as well. But, but right now, the question or the dispute was this, in verse 25 and following, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, and here's, here, you can see where they're like, whoa, what's going on here? Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. And we know based on John's answer that these guys weren't really glad about that. There was, there was kind of a tension there, right? They were caught in between. What's going on here? They're, they're going over to them. They lost their, their purpose of, of John's mission and, and his ministry altogether. And John's response and what we have there, and this is what I want to focus on today, are two absolutely stunning statements that just absolutely blow probably his disciples away and us away if we're looking at it. Two things that John talks to and speaks to. The first is going to be the recognition of God's sovereign grace and salvation. Amen and praise the Lord. He is so And that's just an ongoing thing. You better just get used to it because that's all that John talks about in his gospel is God is sovereign in salvation. We talked about it last or a couple sermons ago. The wind blows where it will. The Holy Spirit's going to go to where God directs them to go. Okay? We talked about that in depth. And John here, unlike Nicodemus, recognizes the sovereignty of God and salvation, number one. And then number two, our main focus for the message is, is that John sums up the true Christians, and if you're honest, hopefully, <laughs> your deepest desire and your greatest necessity is to decrease, right, while Jesus increases in your life and in your heart. That's it. That's, that's like the Christian life just summed up very succinctly. And we struggle with that because we're still battling with sin and we still kind of want the th we want the Lord and we like Paul in Romans 7, we go back and forth at times. I do the things that I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do and ought to do. So there's that struggle there as well for us. So first God's sovereign grace and salvation. John says this, check it out, verse 27, John answered. He didn't say, yeah, man, you're right. I'm kind of bummed out that all these people are going over to him. That's, that's not great. That's not wonderful. I wish, you know, more. remember the crowds that used to be with us? Now they're thinning out, you know, guys. No, John doesn't do that. But he says emphatically, emphatically, a person, verse 27, a person cannot receive even one thing unless, unless, and that's a necessary condition. Something has to happen. Unless something happens, the following won't take place. Unless it's given to him from heaven. Right? So what's John saying there? This is God's sovereign grace. John's saying that nobody would be going to Jesus if God hasn't given it to them in the first place. Amen? That's his sovereign grace. That's what you need to get down. That's what you need to understand, that he is sovereign in all things, especially salvation. That's the theme, one of the major themes of this gospel. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 6, we'll look at a few verses. 
All that the Father gives me, Jesus says, will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Right? Who? All that the Father gives to me. That's God's sovereignty. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one's going to go to you on their own, of their own volition. Like, just kind of come into them. The Lord makes the first move in our hearts, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 65, and he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted him by the Father. Right? That's sovereign. Even Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you haven't received from the Lord? Who gets the credit in all things, beginning with your salvation, but in the rest of your life too? Who? You? See, we like to think that. We're the ones that did it. I did this. I did that. No. You can't have one thing unless God grants it to you. He gets all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. That's it, man. It's all about him. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Salvation is all of God. It's all of grace. And the Christian life really is an extension of that as well. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It must be granted. Listen, man, we're not even willing to receive until he makes us willing. That's why when you talk to people about the gospel and about Jesus, and they don't respond in kind, now that's what we do. We pray for, we try to persuade, we try to, you know, plead with them. We do what we're called to do. We preach the gospel to them. But until or unless the Lord works in their heart, that's why they say no. That's why you have family members. That's why you have friends. That's why, why wouldn't you believe? How can't you believe this? This is life. And yet their hearts are hard. Right? So he gets the glory in that. It can't be earned. It's not deserved. He makes us willing. And John goes on and, and he gets into what we really want to speak to this morning especially. And, and he talks about decreasing while Christ increases. A person can't receive one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness, bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ. I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So he kind of gives them a picture. He's trying to like teach them very nicely, giving them a, an everyday illustration, an example of what's actually happening here in, in a spiritual way. He's saying, look, he uses the analogy of a wedding in the best man. For the groom, the best man is the helper. You know that. He's a very important role. Right? Without the best man, who's going to plan the bachelor party? Huh? <laughs> Back in this time, it was a lot more. He was really by the, the groom's side and helping him prepare for that whole year to take his bride in. So he had a very prominent and important role in the wedding. He does lots of work. But as the wedding draws near, as it comes closer... The, the, the groomsman, the, the, the friend of the bride, he kind of fades out of the way, right? You don't go to a wedding for the best man or the matron of honor. No, you go for the couple, right? You go for, for the, the bride and his groom. That, that's, that's what you go for, and that's what's going on here. So the focus now shifts from John to Christ. And then he makes that second stunning statement. And this needs to be part of your vocabulary. This needs to be ingrained in your heart. This should be one of your easy memory verses. This, I hate bumper stickers. Like, you know, you see the Christian bumper stickers and all that stuff. But this is a good one, man. <laughs> this is one that's what, that should, should just be imprinted on your hearts, on your minds. Verse 30 says this. He must increase, but I must decrease. What's he talking about there? First of all, you need to know it's an imperative. It's not just a suggestion. It's not like, hey, be last, try not to be. Do. No, no, no. It's you must. I must. It has to happen. Something that's, that's commanded, that I don't have an option, right? He must increase and I must decrease. Now, what's he talking about here? Is it time for John's ministry to wind down? And Jesus' ministry to take center stage? Yes, that's true to a degree. That is true. Okay, so, so John is saying, in a sense, look, it's time for Jesus. I, I prepared the way. I did my job. Now it's time for the Lord to take center stage. That's partly true, but there's more to it. There's much more to it than that. There's deeper layers, a deeper aspect to this idea. 
He's saying something that applies to every single believer. If you're a believer in Christ this morning, this applies to you because it speaks to our greatest desire, our highest goal, and our, and our greatest necessity as Christians to decrease while he increases in our lives. That's, that's a major thing because and that's a battle for so many of us. This idea of decreasing and this deeper aspect of it Not just John kind of, you know, his time's up with the ministry. Now it's time for Jesus to take over. This deeper aspect can be seen in John's statements regarding Christ, right? All the while, he's decreasing while Jesus is increasing. If if it's the opposite, if you're increasing, you're in a position like John is in, that's like a cult leader, right? When that cult leader, that person, that man, right? Say the Mormons like Joseph Smith, he's the man. He increases. That's if you're not pointing to Christ, then you're going to increase and you're going to gather a following and you're going to be a cult in that way. John's saying, no, 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 no. I'm be- you go to him. And we see this, this aspect of, of that idea early on when John says, I'm not the Christ. Remember, I'm not the Christ. He is. He keeps saying that because people can mistake him for that. And that's, you know, that's, that's something that can really lift you up, right? Hey, I, I have this prestige. I have this honor. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not the Christ. He is, right? I'm not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals, right? So you see it early on decreasing. I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, right? He's, that's, that's true. That's the, the heart change. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You see that? You see that idea? All the focus is pointed off himself and on to the Lord Jesus Christ. Even here in verse 28, when he says this, I was sent, he was sent to speak of the Son, but the Son was sent by the Father to save sinners, right? And John gets that down. So I was sent by God to speak to him. He was sent to save the world from sin. And then, it's kind of a little bit subtle, but in verse 29, check this out. The one who has the bridegroom, as the bride is the bridegroom. The one who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Right? It's a little bit subtle, but John's saying something there to us. What else was John, how did he self-identify early on? Who did, what did he say about himself? I'm just a, say it, <laughs> I'm just a voice. Crying out in the wilderness. That's all. I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the paths of the Lord. I'm a voice in the wilderness. And he preached repentance. But now he's saying the one who hears him has life. And he rejoices at the at his voice. Understand? That's decreasing. He rejoices at his voice. I'm the voice, right? I'm the voice in the wilderness. No, I'm fading. I'm nothing. He's everything. I rejoice at his voice because he's the one who saves. That was his part of his identity, being that voice in the wilderness. Not anymore. It's consumed by Christ. Understand? He's pointing us in that direction. So how do you decrease? That he might increase. How does that happen? First of all, it begins with conversion. Truly trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right, And if you are trusting in him, if you're a new creation, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone's in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. First of all, you need to be a genuine Christian. And if you are, he will start increasing and you will start decreasing. Right, Because he's working that in you. That's who you become. That's who you are. That's why you must. That's why it's an imperative. It's going to happen. Right? John's saying in verse 30, I'm just like a, I'm like a bridegroom. He needs to increase. The focus needs to be on him because he's the only one who's able to do something about the condition that we're in. I can't do anything to help you. I can't, I can't give you salvation. I can't die for your sins. Only he's the one, he's the one who can do that. He's the one who gets us out of the predicament that we're in, under the wrath that we're under. He, he, he's a solution to, to our, to our problem. He could do something about our situation. What's our situation? We're under God's judgment, man. That's it. It's not like I still have time. I could do it. I could work it out while I'm living. No, 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 no. We talked about this last week. You're already under God's judgment, right? We're already in that prison. You think, oh, we might go to prison. No, you're already there. Remember the silly Planet of the Apes illustration I used? 
right? He was trying to get off to find life. He ends up, that's where he was all the time on earth, right? The place he was trying to escape, he was already there. Well, that's the same here. Look at verse 34, really verse 36, I should say. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. That's very important to understand. What remains upon you? The wrath of God. What's that presuppose? That you are already under the wrath of God. You're already under judgment. That's why Jesus came to deliver us from that. Understand? John can't do that for you. Only Christ can do that. So it begins with conversion. It begins with new life in Christ. It begins by your heart being changed, by being a new creation in him. And it's not, decreasing is not what people do all the time. Because there are people who, who do what? Say, look, man, I'm just turning over a new leaf. I'm sick of the way I'm living. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm starting a new chapter in my life. So I'm just going to, it's not that. That's not decreasing so Christ can increase. It's not self-determination to be a better person, right? We see this all the time. People do this all the time. Look, I'm just, I'm going to try really hard to be less selfish. I'm going to try to be more patient in my life. I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm going to work it out. That's, that's not what we're talking about here, guys. It's not, it's not a self-determination to, to somehow be better. It's not being the, the best version of yourself, which uh, just bums, don't even get me started with that. All right? It's not, hey, I'm going to go to church because I want to be a better person. That's not decreasing so he can increase. That, that's yourself. That's what you're doing. See, when you're truly decreasing, and, he, and he's going to be increasing, it's, it's, not, it's not temporary or even long-term change in your life, the change that you kind of strive to make. But it's an absolute transformation. It's not what you do. Hey, I'm going to try to do this or be that. But it's who you are in Christ. You understand? You're a new creation in Christ, and this is what that looks like. Part of it means you're decreasing while he increases. Now, the little problem with that, little glitch in all that, is that sin plays a role. We're still struggling against sin, and so we still fight against that at times. It begins with conversion, because we're bond servants of Christ. We do say, less of me, more of you. Lord, let me be an instrument in your hand. It's part of who we are in Christ. Now, there is some intentionality to it. Absolutely, there's some. we're aware of it. But we're understanding it's he who's working in us. Listen, as you fade, as you fade, he shines through you. That's it. He shines through you. As you fade, he shines through you. He sh- it shows up in your life. I'm talking about decreasing so he might increase. Where does it show up? In your attitude and in your actions. If you're truly walking and living for the Lord. And you, de- you decrease. Again, the things we're going to talk about, you don't do them so you will decrease, but you're decreasing because you're doing them. Right? I hope, I hope that makes sense. This is all part of who we are as Christians. If you're a true Christian, in other words, this needs to be evident in your life because this is what happens. Right? That's our desire, that, that, that more and more Christ would come through, that we would be consumed by him, and people would see Christ in us. All right? That's it. And that's what John's saying here. I need to decrease because it goes opposite of our natural tendencies. We want to increase, man. We want the prestige. We want the power. We want whatever we want, right? We want people to say this about us. Christian's different. If you're living consistently, you're not going to be loved by the world, man. Just Let's just be honest. They're going to think you're weird and silly. And like Paul says, not many of you were great. Not many of you were high, high, high standard living people. You know, this is, we're fools for Christ. That's what Paul says. And we don't like, that kind of goes against our natural grain, doesn't it? Because we want to be respected. We want to be liked. But if we're living consistently, that's not always going to be the case. All right? So, how do we decrease? And how do you know you're decreasing, that he might increase? Just mention a few things. Number one, you resist the temptation to sin. Right? Because when we sin, we sin in order to gain perceived benefits that that sin offers us at the expense of our obedience to Christ. That's what it is. We see our sin, and it's, we're tempted because it looks good. It's going to give us something we want, something we desire, even though it goes against God's ordinance. Right? So we, we, so 
when we're tempted to sin in that way, when we resist the temptation to sin, we're showing our obedience to the Lord and we're trusting in Christ. When we give in to the sin, every time we give in to our sin, and I know this is going to be convicting, it should be, we're kind of usurping Christ. You know what you do when we give in to our sin? We increase, man. We're increasing because we're getting what we want in that way. And he decreases in us. So if you're living a sinful life, what do people say? Oh, you're supposed to be a Christian? Look at you. You're doing that? You understand? We increase in a sense, and he decreases. So we're to walk in a manner worthy of our calling because that's selfish. When you refuse to compromise the gospel for the sake of peace, it's number two. So you increase, or you decrease, and he increases. When you refuse to compromise the gospel for the sake of peace. This is huge, man. This is huge for us today as Christians. You know what I'm saying? Because we like to water it down a little bit. I'm not saying we need to be mean-spirited or harsh or, you know, fire and brimstone, but we need to be honest with the, with the elements of the gospel. We do. And we can't compromise on that. When we, when we water it down, when we're like overly secretly, seeker-sensitive, okay, we don't want to be rude, but we need to be honest with the truth of the gospel because he's working through that. You, can't, you don't have the right to leave out elements. You can't say, you know, kind of leave out hell or, or call sin just mistakes that we make. You've got to call it what it is. All right? The reality needs to be there. Don't just tell people, oh, look, you need to be sorry for your sin. You need to repent of your sin and explain what that means and turn to the Lord. We can't water that down. We do that in the name of you know, not hurting other people's feelings and bringing them along. That's not our, that's not our job. We're, we're, you've got to give it to them straight. You got to give it to him straight, straight gospel, lovingly, but straight, right? That's what he uses. That's what he commands us to do. And we say that we're so concerned for others and their feelings, and that might be true, but I think deep down when we water down the gospel, we kind of change it around. I think we do that out of fear, sometimes out of shame, a little bit of embarrassment of what people might think about us. So really, again, it comes back to you and selfish. So you kind of increase in that way, increase, and he decreases. You understand? This is how it looks. Give it to give him to him straight. You decrease when you're able to give thanks in every and all circumstances, at least eventually. You know, things are tough, things are difficult, and at the moment it can be really hard. Lord, what's happening? But at some point you come and understand God's providence and his hand in all of this, and you're trusting in him. So in the midst of that pain, you have that peace that passes all understanding, right? That you're able to give thanks in all circumstances and not having the sense of, hey, I'll be content when this happens. Then I'll be happy, right? Then once, once this happens, I'll be okay. But until then, we mope and we complain and, we, and we're kind of grumbling at God. You see, that exalts self. We're not decreasing. When we do that, we're increasing called to decrease. It's hard because it goes against so much of what we naturally want or what seems right at times, what benefits us. Oftentimes it's difficult. We have to do the hard things. Resist temptation and sin. That's tough, man, right? When you want it, you want it. Be straight with the gospel. Talk to people about hell, eternal punishment, wrath, repentance. That's not easy. We want to get around that. But when we when we do that, in a sense, we kind of, quote, increase, and he, he decreases. Right? This is why it's the power of the Holy Spirit. This is why, as Christians, we're, we're, we're called to live this way. If we're always complaining and moping about the situation, and until it gets better, we're just like we're grumbling against God. Where's your peace? Where's your contentment in the Lord? I know it's tough. And he doesn't mind if we bring our cares before him. But if it's like, you know, God, until you get me out of this, I'm going to... We're not called to that. Doing good, whatever it is, if it's from your job to helping others, doing good, not so people will say how wonderful you are, but they'll see how awesome God is in you. And that's a big deal. It's all about motives there. Right? 
when you do things to be noticed or for accolades, right? Oh, so, my, if you do it for that, if you do it to score points, your motives are off. So other people see what you do and know what you do, the good things that you do. That's not cool. That's not what we're called to be. You're called to, 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 to do all that you do, whether you eat or drink, everything you do, you do unto the Lord. Right? That's how, that's how he increases. That's how we decrease. And then if people notice how wonderful you are working, amen, praise God for that. But it's not doing things or doing good so other people say how good you are, how wonderful you are, how nice you are. We're not a respecter of persons. You understand? This is what it means. This is putting uh, legs on, on, on what John is saying there. This is how we decrease. Again, it calls for absolute dependence upon him because it doesn't come naturally to us. Giving generously. When you give generously of your giftedness, man, of your giftedness, when you give of your time, of your talent, of your resources, without expectation of payback, without expectation of reciprocation, well, now I'm going to get it back. Now you owe me. Without keeping a record, man, if you keep a record, you get go. Go away. Tear that up, man. That's not good. I'm not saying keep a record for business purposes. That's not, but you know what I'm saying in your heart, man. If you keep a record of doing good and expecting payback, and here's what I did for you, now you owe me. That You're, you're increasing. You're not decreasing. You understand? We don't live like that. That's not who we are as, as Christians. People are amazed when they see, like, what? You don't expect anything in return? What? You don't want payback? What do I have to do to pay? No. It's from the Lord. You understand? These are the kinds of things. These, these are the things that we need to do. Otherwise, you increase. Respecting other people? Well, you show no partiality and you play no favorites. That's tough, man. And that's very convicting. But that's who we're called to be. Do you show partiality to some people? Do you play favorites with other people? That's that. No. To do that means that you're increasing. And he's decreasing. To write other people off because they're not just like you. To treat others badly. We're called to show love, the love of Christ. Again, very difficult without partiality. It doesn't mean you can't have be closer to some people than others. You have personalities, you click. I'm not talking about that, man. I'm just talking about the attitude and the spirit that some people have, including Christians, towards others who aren't just like them or towards sinners like you were. And now, look at them. Until you change, I'm not coming to where you are. See, that's not who we are in Christ. We don't play favorites. We don't show partiality. We love with the love of Christ. Again, it's so hard to do. It's easy to say and preach this. But apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, no. Because when we do that, we show partiality, we play favoritism, we put ourselves in that position of authority and power, don't we, a little bit? We kind of hold over, well, you're not good enough for me. Well, you are, Leela, but I don't know about you. <laughs> right? We don't do that. It's not who we are in Christ. This is what makes us different. This is what separates us from the world. This is why we don't seek to strive and achieve as the world does. But obedience and faithfulness, that's our calling. That's our achievement. That's what we're called to do. Right? Decreasing. Putting up graciously when we're wronged. How many of you love your rights? You love your rights and you want it to be right. And you're not going to be happy until you get your rights because it's right, darn it. I feel like seeing the other word, but you know, I want my rights, and I'm not going to rest. It. See, we're not called in that way. When Jesus was reviled, what did he do in return? Did he revile in return? Did he give it back to them like he could have? He probably should have. No. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, but he kept silent and trusting himself to the Father. Right. Putting up graciously when you're wrong doesn't mean you can't seek justice, but be gracious in terms of that and not, not willing to just get even. And here's what you did to me, so I'm going to hurt you. No, oh, that's not our spirit. So when we do those kinds of things, we increase. And Christ decreases in a sense. Decreasing, and what John's saying, is not so much about trying. But it's already, it's being who you already are in Jesus Christ. Do you understand? 
That's a big deal. Because if you're trying so hard, I'm not saying we're not intentional or we won't seek to live this way, but understand we can't do it apart from the power of the Holy Spirit who works in us. And we want to be consumed by Christ. Like Paul says this in Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. That's the sense behind this. I don't live anymore. It's him. It's Christ who lives in me. He's saying what John is saying. I must decrease that he may increase. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because you see, when you increase, Jesus decreases. How about you? Can you say this? What John says, I must decrease that he may increase. Can you say this? in your heart of hearts this morning, that you're living this way. And if you can say it, that's even one thing. But is it evident in your life? Is it evident? When people look at you, do they see Christ?